What is it about God's kingdom that is unique and that is different? Today we explore that. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembert. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television. You've tuned into a television program that is designed to take you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We are coming up on Revelation. I'm so excited about this because we're going through the Bible. How important is that? Very important. Today we're going to talk about Hebrews. Now, Hebrews communicates God's kingdom. And you say, well, how important is that? Well, it's very important to the people who have the Jewish mindset. And so that's what the book is written to. It's written to the Hebrews. It is very interesting study today, so we're going to do that. Corey, what are you doing? Today we're going to be talking about a few very famous ancient governors of Judea. Excellent. We're, we're still into the politics of the New Testament, which is always fascinating. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, what did you study? We are going to take a look at today how the book of Hebrews contributes to the Bible. Contributes, really? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Okay, we've studied a lot. We've got a lot of material. Here comes Corey. Watch this. The New Testament Gospels take place during a time of transition for Judea. They went from having a king, King Herod, who was a client king for Rome, to a governor of Judea. What happened there? After Herod the Great's diseased death of 4 BC, Emperor Augustus in Rome received an onslaught of visitors. Groups of men begging against another ruler like Herod and Herod's own sons each desiring power over Herod's territory. While Herod had remained faithful to Augustus during his lifetime, it seems everyone else was dispensable. After the murder of three of his own sons, a later historian records an offhanded comment of Augustus about Herod's kosher habits. It is better to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. Perhaps it was pity that led Augustus to allow Herod's son some power. More likely, though, it was the previous loyalty of Herod and his buttering up of the emperor, with his will bequeathing major amounts of wealth to Augustus. With his pockets sufficiently padded and revolts needing to be crushed, Augustus appointed Herod's son Archelaus as regional governor, not king, of Judea and surrounding areas, and Herod's other sons, Antipas, as governor over Galilee and Philip II over the mostly Gentile territory to the northeast. Both Antipas and Philip lasted a very long time at their posts, but their brother Archelaus fared less well. According to Matthew 2.22, Archelaus's rule made Joseph fearful of bringing his wife Mary and the young Jesus back to Judea. Why? Because Archelaus ruled with violence. Days before Herod the Great's death, two religious teachers rallied their pupils to climb the temple and tear down the golden eagle, that symbol of Rome that Herod had dared to place there. As one of Herod's final acts, he had those teachers and students publicly burned alive. Upon Herod's death just days later, the people demanded recompense be made by Archelaus. When he refused, the people began causing unrest within the temple complex, which was full of pilgrims for the Passover. Archelaus decided his military would solve this best. The result was 3,000 dead in the temple complex. For 10 years, Archelaus ruled without political savvy. In AD 6, Caesar Augustus had Archelaus banned to Gaul. And for the first time, a Roman would have power over Judea. So there we have it. Some of the back history to how we went from Herod the Great, King Herod, then from his son who did not do a very good job all the way to Caponius. Now, after Caponius, there is a line of governors then that go on through history. The only other one mentioned in uh, the Bible as governor of Judea is, of course, Pontius Pilate, who is definitely the most famous governor of Judea from ancient times. And that's simply because of his dealings with Jesus Christ. But Pontius Pilate did a lot of other things as well. Uh, his 
governorship over Judea. There's some mixed reviews here. I mean, he did a good enough job to not get uh, banished uh, from uh, Rome or, or even executed or given a suicide order, which was very common uh, for governors who were doing a poor job. Uh, Pontius Pilate managed to walk that very thin line between doing some pretty horrible things and appeasing the people enough to not be exiled or executed by uh, the Caesar of his time period. Now, we're going to be moving on and taking a look at a few more cultural things a little bit later in the program. So please stay tuned because this time period is just really interesting. It's very tumultuous. And the New Testament is, uh, you know, it's talking about very specific history and theology, but underneath all that is more interesting history. The book of Hebrews contains 13 chapters. The author of the book is unknown. Now, many believe Paul the Apostle is the author inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Bible never really tells us for sure. The interesting thing about the book of Hebrews is that it is very spiritual. For example, the first chapter quotes God from Scripture many times in many ways. The book of Hebrews is dynamic in truth about God and, and how he works in the world. It is written to the Hebrews, explaining how salvation makes itself known on this sin-cursed planet. It answers many of the questions that convict the Hebrew mind. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 14. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning, laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed but you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits set forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Hebrews, what an amazing book this is. And as we study it, we open up the pages and we see some 
tremendous statements about heaven here and amazing statements about God and what God says. This is so amazing. It's totally unbelievable. And today we're going to begin to study the book of Hebrews. It's important. But I want to remind you that we have the Bible guide with four points and many other things that are part of this. And if you don't have yours, write for it and we'll send it to you right away. Also, you're going to have to be on the mailing list to get the new Bible guides. And I want you to get a hold of those. So it's important. But Hebrews is important because the people of, of, uh, who are being written to have a Hebrew mindset. And God is trying to explain to them the difference. Now, remember that the trouble is not in the Gentiles in terms of understanding the scripture for salvation, but the trouble is in the Hebrews because it was a big deal. I mean, if you're Hebrew and all of a sudden you learn that it's through faith you come to Jesus Christ, you're you're saying, wait a minute, what about the law? And so that had to be developed. Well, Hebrews is something that explains the law and explains the heavenly language in order for you to understand it. So today we have wisdom in the book of Hebrews. It is great. Divine thinking and ability. Reading is Hebrews chapter 1 to 5. And as you continue to read through the Bible, that's very exciting. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 14. This is our focus. We're going to look at this and try to understand what he's saying. Some people believe that Paul the Apostle is the writer of the book of Hebrews. I tend to think that, but the Bible doesn't tell us that, so we're just going to go in and understand it, but it doesn't matter who the writer is, it's the Holy Spirit. That's the point that we need to emphasize. Now we begin in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. The Bible tells us, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds, and who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he had by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, this is interesting, and we're talking about uh, Jesus Christ and the angels. So the Hebrew writer says, Jesus Christ is the one who communicates for God's kingdom, not the angels, not the angels. We are to worship Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Are you ready for that? Did you get that? Because a lot of people look at that and they say, well, wait a minute, Rod, I, I, I need to pray to an angel. I need to think about an angel. No, you need to pray to Jesus Christ. What is it that Jesus Christ said? Do you remember he said, come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Jesus Christ said that. He said, I will give you rest. Now that's very important. And Jesus Christ tells his disciple, tell them in my name. What was the name that was banned from Jerusalem uh, the minute the church exploded? It was the name Jesus Christ. Because that name had such power and had such ability because it identified the one whom God sent. Very important. We go back to the scripture. It says, for to which of you or to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And the angels, he says, who make his angels spirits and his ministers of flames of fire. But to the son of God, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. He again states that the message of Jesus Christ is different. The Hebrew writer explains that the words of God concerning his son and sets up his ruling scepter. God rules. And we see in the Revelation chapter 19 that that the Lord is the one who is the one we want to pray to and 
In Revelation 19, I want to be on the other side of Jesus Christ because that's very important. God is the ruler. He is the one that has all authority. In fact, he said that in Matthew chapter 28. All authority has been given to me, Jesus said. And so the authority of God is given to Jesus and we pray to Jesus Christ and allow him to work through us. And that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is all about. So it's important that we remember that. Then we go to Hebrews 1, 9 through 12, and we learn this. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up and they will be changed. But you, Lord, are the same and your years will not fail. Now that is amazing to the complications of the eternity of God. The Hebrew writer says that Jesus Christ does not change, even though everything else does. And I want to tell you something. We live in a world today that's in a lot of change. We have a world that's got, you know, you got Twitter and, and you got Facebook and you've got LinkedIn, you got all these different social networks and everybody's running around changing things and doing things and we're running here, running there, running there. But let me tell you something, Jesus Christ has not changed. The sin nature is still the sin nature. We need Jesus Christ now. Jesus Christ will come again very shortly. But come to Jesus today, come to him now and allow yourself to experience it. Right now, you and I are going to take a look at the life and reign of the most ancient, famous governor of Judea. We're going to be looking at Pontius Pilate, but not just what he did recorded in the New Testament, other stuff that he did. Remembered well for his sentencing of Jesus to death by crucifixion, Pontius Pilate has traveled through history by several contemporary sources. We have historians Philo and Josephus, an inscription bearing his name in Caesarea, and the Gospel records of the Bible. Pontius Pilate was the prefect or governor of the new province of Judea. In 4 BC, when Herod the Great died, his kingdom was split and given to his three sons, subservient to Rome. But the son ruling Judea was dethroned in AD 6. Judea named a province and a governor installed to keep peace. To be appointed governor, Pontius Pilate would have been of the equestrian order, a privileged class, and he would have had charge of auxiliary troops, which were a specialized non-citizen army equally deadly and numerous as the Roman legions. During his rule in Judea, Pilate got himself into one too many scrapes. Josephus records that one night he quietly brought Roman standards bearing images of the Roman gods into Jerusalem. This offensive act caused a confrontation with the Jews. Pilate threatened to execute them, but when they willingly exposed their necks to give the guards better aim, Pilate acquiesced and removed the standards. More controversy came when Pilate took money from the temple's treasury for an aqueduct, and again when he made expensive shields naming the emperor as God and sent them to Herod's palace in Jerusalem. Pilate's interaction with Jesus came during the unstable time of Emperor Tiberius's Great Purge. Likely, Pilate's main goal was to keep everyone quiet so he could escape any notice at all. And yet, his one too many offense came soon after Christ's execution. Pilate put down a potential Samaritan rebellion by simply killing all the assembled men. To keep peace more peacefully, Pilate was pulled from office and sent back to Rome.
Thank you for staying with us and being with us. If you've just joined us here on Quick Study Television, it is great to have you. We go through the Bible again from Genesis to Revelation, and we are excited. And on this program, we're in the end or the back part of the Bible, getting ready to do Revelation. It's very exciting. And next year, just a few days away, man, we are going to continue again. Yes, we are. All new material. Yes. It's going to be exciting. I've already written the first part of it. It's excellent. Uh, but anyway, here's what we're going to talk about on the next program. It is impossible for us to keep failing God's salvation. That's impossible for us to do. We cannot do that. And uh, what do we do about that? Well, we'll find out next time on Quick Study <laughs> Television. Uh, right now, you studied for the question. What mm -hmm. did you study? Well, we are in the book of Hebrews for the next couple of days, so I thought it might be interesting to take a look at how the book of Hebrews actually contributes to the Bible. So, I want to just say a couple of points, and then we can talk about the new year coming up. So, no other book in the New Testament ties together the Old Testament history and practices with the life of Jesus Christ as thoroughly as the book of Hebrews. And just as Jesus Christ taught that the Old Testament was fulfilled in himself, and we can read that in Matthew chapter 5 and in Luke chapter 24, so the author of Hebrews taught that the Old Covenant was brought to completion in the New Covenant, and that's Hebrews chapter 7 mm. into verse 8. Eight. So those are just a couple of the, the contributions that Hebrews makes and, and that's, to the that's Bible. And that's really important because the Hebrews is written to the Hebrew to mindset. To the Hebrew mindset. Yeah, yes, that's exactly. very important. So it's talking a lot about the, the Old Covenant yeah. and the New Covenant with Jesus and its superiority because of the work and ministry yeah. of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. So and it, and uh, it's going to be a good couple of days of study. It is. And it's important for us to do that and, and stay on the study. But listen, I need to tell you about something. We are, in fact, uh, putting together, and I'll just tell you this, it's a new set, and the new set is fascinating. And, and I want to tell you that uh, our set, this set here, uh, you know, with the lights over here and the lights back there, that, that's all material that we got, we found, very cheap and, and very some inexpensive. Donated. Some don't. Well, actually, many donated it, and uh, it's important that you realize, actually, do you want to know something? The, the two items over on Corey's set, the Jeep and the tent, are mine personally. Uh, they're <laughs> Sorry, Corey, but it's mine personally. Shows how many times we go camping. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, we don't anymore. But, exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but the, the Willis Jeep is uh, made in uh, 1951, and those were used in Korea and all that stuff, and I got a hold of that. I think it was, I don't know how, it cost me more to pay the tower to drive it here. Uh, but that was a long, time, long ago. time ago, and at least I never imagined it years. being used in a set, and that was before Corey was doing her thing. Uh -huh. And the tent, I've, I've always had the tent. Yeah. I bought it way back 15 years ago mm -hmm. when the church was starting, and I needed a tent to camp with the people. And that's a lot of this set. A lot of the set is donated. The instruments, everything's donated, and so it's not, it's not an expensive set. And this set's going to change. Well, and Rachel McDonald here on our staff, she Behind just that camera. she just suggested to before that really we are a DIY staff. What does that mean? Do it yourself. We do it ourselves, and uh, they've come up with a, a great plan and a, yeah. an idea. So we're going to begin to put that together. So January will look different. It will. It'll look good. And, uh, the, you know, we've already, to, we've already looked at the set. We've already planned it. We've already done everything. Mm -hmm. We've worked very hard. Uh, and I don't know what it's, it's going to uh, totally look like, but it, it's going to be, when we get it up, you'll see, it'll be excellent. And so, it's a do-it-yourself set. A do-it-yourself set, but also a new pocket guide, which is really important for you viewers out there to get a hold of. If you have been reading with us this year in 2015 and you are on the mailing list, great. But please do let us know right away that you want to continue in 2016. And those of you, maybe you've just been new to the program today, or maybe you've been watching for the last few months but don't have the guide, we would love for you to write us or to call us or get in touch with us on the website so that you you can sign up and be ready to receive your pocket guide that comes a few days before the first of the month so that you can begin to read with us. The pocket guide's important this year because it's a critical year. 
this year in terms of all of the different things going on, 2016 is really important. You're talking in the world. Yeah, in the world. It's mm -hmm. really important. And so what we've done is I've written and I put together the basic foundational doctrines and that's fresh. And I've also put together fascinating facts and all kinds of things. And here's the address. P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668150. That is in the United States of America. That is very important. That's our same address. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2, for other countries and for Canada. But it's also important for you to understand that you can get a hold of us on the Internet at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Angels are not to be worshipped. The Bible explains this in many ways. The book of Hebrews tells us the truth about the spiritual world. We do well to pay attention to it. The ownership belongs to Jesus Christ. He not only owns everything, but he came and lived a perfect life, died and then rose again from the earth to take authority from Satan, who we gave it to at the beginning of time. This is the mystery of God. Why not just start over, erase every person on the planet and manipulate time and space? Well, God chooses instead to take it back. We cannot know the answer, but we can know the one who does the work. The Lord Jesus Christ is real and he's alive and he rose from the dead 2,000 years ago after he was crucified and we crucified him not for his sin, but for ours. And it's important for you to know that he rose from the dead. No one helped him, obviously. And as he rose from the dead, he went to heaven and sent his Holy Spirit. And he said, all who call on me, come to me and call on me, I will give you rest. Come to Jesus today.